Okay, we're going to go ahead and get this kicked off. Um, again, I want to thank everybody that's joined us today. I know we still have some folks that are going to be getting logged in, uh, but in the interest of time, we want to be uh, respectful of everybody's time. We want to go ahead and get started. So I want to welcome everybody to today's live webinar for Million Acres. And uh, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide and tell you a little bit about the session and tell you a little bit about who Million Acres is, uh, first and foremost, before we uh, bring our speaker on. Okay, first and foremost, you know, so you know who's presenting today and who you're talking to. So first and foremost, Million Acres, we're a Motley Fool service uh, that's dedicated to making the world smarter, happier, and richer through real estate investing. Uh, our company is staffed almost exclusively by experts in real estate and real estate investing. And we as a service provide expert analysis and investment recommendations uh, to our subscribers through free and premium services. So at the end of the day, you know, we're a service that you subscribe to. Uh, and as such, you get analysis from folks like the wonderful gentleman who's about to present to you today on uh, how to get started in investing in real estate. So I'd like to introduce uh, Matt Frankel, who's going to be our presenter today. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Matt, and then I'm going to let him uh, take over. He's a senior uh, analyst uh, here at Million Acres. Uh, he's a certified financial planner and has been at uh, Fool.com, which is the parent company. Uh, he's been contributing to that since 2012. He's a graduate of the University of South Carolina uh, and Nova Southeastern University. Uh, after a few years uh, as a high school mathematics teacher, he decided to combine his loves for teaching, uh, writing, and investing to help people manage their financial lives better. And we're thrilled to have him. And I know you're going to be thrilled to hear from him today. His presentations are wonderful. Matt, I'll let you take it over. All right. I even remembered to unmute myself this time. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Matt Frankel. Like uh, Kevin just said, thank you for that nice introduction. I'm also our advisor on a couple of our premium products. You'll hear about one of them later on today. So we are going to talk about kind of why to invest in real estate first, and then I'm going to go through all the different ways you could possibly invest in real estate. Um, there, there are more than you may think. A lot of people think um, rental properties. Uh, a lot of people think fixing and flipping houses, especially if you're an HGTV fan. There's a lot of shows that have kind of brought that into the mainstream in the past few years. So before we do that, just reasons to invest in real estate. And this is a fact on the top of the, the slide you're seeing right now. Uh, more billionaires became millionaires from real estate than from any other asset class. Now, a lot of that has to do with homeowners just owning equity in their houses. But a lot of that is investors, too. Um, historically, millionaires have been made and billionaires have been made from investing in real estate. Um, so there are some really good reasons to invest in real estate. Income is an obvious one. If you own a rental property, you collect rent, you're a landlord, um, you're going to generate income. It could be a great way to generate a passive or an active income stream, depending on the level of involvement you want with real estate investing. Um, real estate can also be a great way to preserve capital. We've seen plenty of studies over the past few years that indicate that over long periods of time, real estate has been less volatile than, say, the stock market. Um, if anyone was a stock investor in 2000, you know just how volatile the markets can be. Um, in in March 2020, uh, just just for example, I was you know glued to my my computer and monitor watching watching my stock portfolio, but wasn't worried at all about what my rental property's value were, was. It, it you know the value just doesn't fluctuate as much. So income, capital preservation, and long-term wealth creation. Real estate is a great total return investment, as we call it. It, it produces income and it can add value over time. The value of real estate tends to go up over time. It's not a straight line as people in the late 2000s found out, but it, it does tend to be a great wealth creator over the long term. When you combine it with income, real estate has produced total returns over time. They're equal to or better than the stock market over you know, when you're measuring your investment returns in decades. So those are some of the really good reasons to invest in real estate, but how do you do it? The thing, the point I really want to drive home today is there's a way to invest in real estate, no matter how much money you have, no matter how much time you want to put into it, and no matter how much your risk tolerance is. So the first way, and one of the ways we, one of the things we are really focused on um, is real estate investment trusts or REITs. Um, so that's probably the easiest way to invest in real estate. 
And I put the pronunciation there just because so many people get it wrong. And I want you, everyone listening here to, to get it right. So REITs are a special type of company that are created for the sole purpose of owning real estate investments. Some own physical properties, which are the kind that we focus on. Um, and some own mortgage assets, which are technically part of the financial sector, kind of like banks. The key takeaway is these trade on the stock market for the most part. There are REITs that invest in pretty much any type of commercial property that you could think of. Um, there's a REIT that owns the Empire State Building. There are REITs that own shopping malls. There are REITs that own high-rise apartment buildings. So it's essentially a way for investors to pool their money together for the purpose of investing in commercial real estate assets. The good things about this is one, it's a totally liquid investment. You can buy or sell REITs immediately with just a click of a button. Um, if you wanna cash out, you can just hit a button and get your money. Um, they have a low upfront capital requirement. You can invest in a REIT for the price of one share. Um, if a REIT is trading for $50, that's all you need to get started which is why I said earlier that there's a way to invest in real estate, no matter how much money you have. Um, they are a truly passive real estate investment. REITs have their own management teams. You don't have to you know, collect rent. You don't have to do it, you know, do maintenance, any of that. You buy your shares, just like any other stock, you buy your shares, hold on to them, and that's it. Um, they, the reason REITs were created, they were created in the 1960s, and they were created to give people access to commercial real estate assets that have historically not been available to them. Like I mentioned, most people listening to this cannot go buy the Empire State Building. You can't go buy a shopping mall. But through the magic of REIT investing, you can invest in these type of assets. These are the type of assets that have made billionaires over time um, and have historically just been the realm of the rich. But thanks to REITs, you can get in on them too. And like I said, Leslie, you can buy REITs just like any other stock with the click of a button. So they're easy. Um, number two, this kind of goes along with REITs. Um, we kind of group all real estate stocks that are not technically REITs. Um, REITs are stocks that own property for the purpose of generating income and, and growth. Um, there are some real estate stocks that don't own property, but are still good real estate investments. Uh, Zillow is a good example that I'm, I'm, I, I think of as a real estate stock whose primary business isn't to buy and hold real estate. Um, Redfin, another example, the, the kind of tech-focused brokerage firm. Uh, Reology is another one. They own a lot of uh, major brokerage brands that you've probably heard of, like Century 21. Um, so these are companies that make their money from real estate businesses but aren't in the business of buying, holding, and renting real estate. And then you could buy mutual funds and ETFs. If you're, if you're familiar with index fund investing, for example, if that's you know, your comfort zone, you can find real estate index funds. You can find real estate um, ETFs and mutual funds to invest in. Uh, the, the Vanguard real estate ETF is one that we, com we commonly use as a benchmark. Uh, the ticker symbol for that one is VNQ. So that's number two. Um, number three, a less common way to invest, but one that's worth mentioning is to invest in mortgage notes, essentially becoming a lender. This is easier than it used to be, which is why I bring it up in my list of ways to invest in real estate. So the number one reason you would invest in mortgages instead of properties is because it's a very consistent income stream. If you are somebody's mortgage lender, you get that payment every month, no matter what the value of their house does, no matter if there's a, a tenant occupying it, it's a, a reliable income stream. Your upside is limited, meaning that if the house home value goes up, you don't profit, but the income is very reliable. And that's kind of the idea. It's, mortgage investing is a, a, a popular invest in, an investment for retirees, for example, who are concerned with capital preservation. Um, so you might even be able to invest in these through your retirement account. There are types of retirement accounts called self-directed IRAs and self-directed 401ks that allow you to buy investments that are not stocks. Um, so there are several ways you can invest in mortgages. There are clearing houses that kind of specialize in mortgage debt. And recently, we're gonna talk about this more in a little bit, but there are crowdfunding platforms that allow people to pool their money together to finance mortgages. Obviously, if you're gonna be someone's mortgage lender who's buying a $300,000 house, a lot of people can't do that because it's cost prohibitive. So crowdfunding allows you to you know, put 
$500 of that mortgage loan in and it pulls investors money to invest in a mortgage loan. Um, there are some great crowdfunding platforms that are, are debt focused, which can be great. Next slide. Four, this is the this is what most people think of when you hear the term real estate investing. And this is a lot of what I do is um, you know, buying and holding rental properties. So it takes a fair amount of capital to get started. You'll see a lot of somewhat misleading advertisements claiming you can get started with rental property investing for no money, no money down or for very little capital. While it's possible to get started in rental properties for, for little money down, you should plan on needing some form of substantial form of capital to get involved. I generally suggest planning to put at least 20% down on your first rental property. It's not like a primary residence where you could find a 3% down mortgage for a rental property, for example. Um, plan on putting at least 20% down. There's an exception called house hacking where you uh, buy a multi-unit property and live in one of the units while renting out the others, that you, that you can kind of get around that. But if you're just buying a standalone rental property, plan on putting at least 20% down, plan on having at least 5% of the purchase price as kind of a, a just-in-case fund. Um, the last thing you, I can tell you from experience, the last thing you want is to buy a rental property, have an unexpected, unexpected expense come up that you weren't planning on and not have the money for it. So, this is a more capital intensive form of real estate investing than the, the three we've talked about so far, but it can be a great way to invest. Um, reasons are rental properties are a great combination of income and growth. Again, you're, you're the landlord, you're collecting rent. Um, if you really learn your stuff and can research properties, right, and find good cash flow and properties, you can make a nice income stream on rental properties. Um, Real estate tends to increase in value over time. Um, historically, real estate has appreciated by about 3% a year. So if you can buy a property, make say, you know, five to 6% of the purchase price in the form of income each year, and it's growing by 3% a year, do the math. That could be a double digit uh, return with, with not that much risk. And that's if you're buying it in cash. The second bullet point there, you can safely use leverage um, obviously, in the, the financial crisis era, people were not using leverage safely. But you can safely use leverage um, to invest in rental properties in order to boost your returns. Um, you might have heard uh, people doing margin investing in the stock market. That's not a safe use of leverage. But with real estate, because, go back a few slides, real estate is less volatile than other forms of investments, meaning the prices don't jump all over the place it's a lot safer to use leverage when you're investing in real estate and you can boost your returns. Um, it's not uncommon for a rental property to generate 15 to 20% annualized returns over the long term when you're using a safe amount of leverage. And number three, you can eventually use your equity to grow your portfolio. Um, there are good books on this. It's called the BRRRR strategy, which calls for buy, rent, repair, refinance, repeat. I think I got those in the correct order, but um, so for example, if you're, if your rental property has either gone up and done some improvements to it, or you've paid down the mortgage a good bit, you can do a cash out refinance, just like you would on your primary home and use some of that equity to invest in more real estate and grow your portfolio. It's a very, uh, popular wealth creation kind of snowball effect strategy. Okay. Number five is a similar um, idea. It is short-term rentals, which a few years ago, I wouldn't have recommended to people. But nowadays with platforms like, like I said, Airbnb, Vacasa, and VRBO, um, renting out a home on a short-term basis can be easier and more profitable than ever. And this includes doing things like buying a second home for your own use and renting it out when you're not there which is uh, like it's with Airbnb and things like that is easier than ever before. Um, so a few things to keep in mind here, short-term rentals require significantly more time commitment than long-term rentals. Um, even if you're planning on hiring a property manager, plan on you know answering phone calls from them more often, dealing with maintenance requests, things like that. Short-term rentals are, are just a more time intensive form of investing than, than long-term. Um, 
your income stream isn't likely to be as consistent, which is to be expected when you're you know, renting your property on daily or weekly basis uh, rather than rather than annual. So the income potential is the key differentiator here. If I were to buy, say, a two-bedroom condo at the beach and rent it out to a long-term tenant and buy a sa- the same property and rent it out as a weekly vacation rental, the income potential for the short-term rental is off the charts better. Um, just in one market that I'm, that I'm investing in, a, you know, a two-bedroom condo on the beach would run for about three, two, 2,500 to 3,000 a month as a long-term rental. As a weekly vacation rental, you would get about two thousand dollars a week for it. So the income potential is lo- is more, but the trade off is it's less consistent, and you you should be prepared for more more of a time commitment to manage it. And um, if you are hiring a property manager, by the way, on a long term rental, you can expect to pay that property manager about ten percent of the rent. With a vacation home or a short term rental, you can expect a fee in the twenty five percent ballpark. Um, and it's because it's more of a time commitment, not only on your behalf, but on the property manager's behalf as well. You know, they have to find a new tenant every few days, every few weeks. Um, so it's, there are trade-offs, just like everything on, all 10 of the, the real estate investment types on this list have their, their pros and cons. So there's no such thing as a perfect investment for everybody. And if there is, I certainly haven't found it yet. Um, number six, I mentioned this in the introduction, fixed and flips. Um, so you might have seen shows on HDTV about flipping houses. The one thing I would say before we even get into this side is that flipping houses is not nearly as easy as it looks on TV. If you have the time and you want to acquire the knowledge to do it correctly, there is serious money to be made, which the shows on HGTV do a good job of, of making that very clear, that there's a lot of money to be made. But it takes a lot of time and effort to fix and flip houses. This is more appropriate for someone who wants a second job. This is not just a passive investment strategy. There's a lot of room for error in fix and flips. It's really easy to lose money if you don't, if, and, and through no fault of your own, if it just takes the house longer than expected to sell. For example, if you, know, if you, if you take a mortgage out to buy a house to flip, you have to pay that mortgage while the house is unoccupied and sitting on the market. So there's a lot of room for error. Um, In an ideal case, you can make a lot of money and in less than ideal case, you can lose a lot of money. So my advice, if you wanna flip houses, start with a project that's relatively, that should say small and manageable. Um, Sorry, if that's the worst typo, it was still a good day. (laughs) But start with a project that's relatively small and manageable. For example, if you buy a small house that needs mostly cosmetic repairs, that would be a good place to start trying of trying to fix and flip. And that kind of brings to the last bullet point there. The number one asset you could have as a house flipper is the team around you. So starting small will help you build up a team of, of contractors, for example, and a realtor who could sell the house quickly, who's, who's a real expert in those type of homes on your market. Um, there's, I can't overstate that enough. If you want to fix and flip houses, having, building up a great team around you is the number one asset you will ever have more than your own knowledge even, um, is ha- like having a, a contractor who prioritizes you because you give them a lot of business or something like that. So th- it, it takes time to build that up. So like I said, start small. If, if you're interested in fixing and flipping and build up your network, build up your your, your knowledge and, and then go from there. Don't start fixing and flipping with a million dollar home. That's just asking to lose all your money. Number seven, investing in land. Um, I, in, in a lot of areas of the country right now, there is no shortage of land for sale. And I can tell you that in my own personal market, um, instead of buying a building, you could invest in vacant land. Um, so the thing to know before we go on is this is a really speculative way to invest in real estate. There are a few ways you can potentially profit off of land. You can just hold it and hope it goes up in value. If you, um, um, for example, I live kind of on the outskirts of a major uh, metropolitan area in the Southeast. If you, and, and you know, as the, the city grows, 
they build further and further out. So land that's on the outskirts could become more valuable as they start to build. So that's one reason you might buy land for, for like a speculative investment. If you want a more active investment, you could buy land to build what they call a spec house on. Spec is short for speculative. Um, so, or speculation rather. So you buy, a house, buy land, build a house on it, and then sell the house. Um, that could be you know, a good way to profit because you can generally do that if you know what you're doing cheaper than you know, just buying a home that already exists. Um, think of that as kind of a, a fix and flip with an extra step in it. So or you, if you really want to get involved, you can buy a large piece of land and develop it into say home sites or something like that. Um, I wouldn't recommend that unless you really know what you're doing. Um, but the, the perk is that land can be a lower cost way to invest in real estate. Um, especially in lower cost markets, like in the Sunbelt region, buying land is significantly less expensive than buying an actual home. Um, so it could be a lower cost way to invest in real estate. There are a few different ways you can pursue a land investment. Uh, one thing to know, it can be really difficult to finance land. Um, usually a lender bases home fine or real estate financing on one of two things. The fact that you're going to live in the home or that you are going to rent the home out and generate income. Since you can't do either of those on vacant land, it can be difficult unless you're a, a real estate business that has experience with land development or something like that. It can be very difficult to finance, say like buying a, a vacant lot just by itself uh, with no immediate like, plans to build on it. So moving along to number eight, which is buying foreclosures. So this can either be a way to fix and flip homes or um, buy rental properties. But it's kind of its own little specialty, which is why we mention it different or separately here. Um, so REO stands for real estate owned. Um, it's another word for foreclosure pretty much. It means when a bank owns a house that it has repossessed. Um, so buying a foreclosure can be a difficult and complex process even if it's already listed on the market, even if you come in with a full price offer, even if you get a contract uh, signed, and even if you have financing ready to go, there's just a lot that happens behind the scenes. Say if Fannie Mae owns a house that can make a deal take longer. There's, it's just a whole lot of, you know, office procedures that need to be gone through. Um, I found that out the hard way when I bought a foreclosure, but the reward potential, if you're willing to go through all those headaches, can be fantastic. Um, just in, in my market, I bought a house that normally would have gone for about $130,000 for $99,000 through, through Fannie Mae, um, just because it was a foreclosure and it was kind of a pain to buy. But it was well worth it in the end. So foreclosures can be a great way to get homes for less than real market value. Um, and so they can make good rental properties or fix and flips. Most foreclosures are in need of some repairs, um, in my experience. It's really rare to find a foreclosure that is move-in ready. So it can make a good combination property in that you could buy it, do some cosmetic repairs, and then rent it out for a great income. Um, but to really maximize foreclosure investing, you need to really know what you're doing. Um, for example, the the to maximize your profits, you should buy homes at, at auction at foreclosure auctions, not once they're already listed on the market. Um, but that takes real know how to do, and it's a lot more complex than I could cover in a, a 30 minute webinar. Um, okay, so number nine, and this is one I really want to talk about uh, because it's really new and exciting it's uh, real estate crowdfunding. Um, the concept of crowdfunding has emerged in the past decade or so. And it basically means investors po or people pooling their money to achieve a common goal. Um, there are a lot of reputable real estate crowdfunding platforms that have popped up. Uh, right there, I see CrowdStreet and uh, Realty Mogul are two of the, the ones that I put on the slide. But there's a bunch of them. Um, these allow investors to participate in single asset private equity real estate deals. So how, the biggest difference between crowdfunding investing and REIT investing is a REIT, a real estate investment trust, invests in multiple assets. Like, for example, you might buy a REIT that invests in 200 different office properties. However, crowdfunding deals are generally one asset. Like, you might find a crowdfunding deal that wants to buy one office building and fix it up to increase its value, or one hotel to renovate, 
things like that. So you can invest in single asset real estate deals, usually having to do with some form of development, whether it's a renovation or building something from the ground up. Um, there is the potential for fantastic returns. If you go to CrowdStreet and look at their, um, their, their track record, they publish all their investment returns for, for deals that have finalized. Um, some of them have really fantastic returns and few of them have lost money. Um, there's potential for really great returns, like like 20% annualized returns in, in a lot of cases are, are, are not uncommon with crowdfunding deals. Um, a few things to note, um, crowdfunding, one is only as safe as the platform vetting the deal. So when I, I say reputable uh, crowdfunding sites, that stick with the good ones, the big ones, regardless of what some unknown crowdfunding site might be promising you, you're better off sticking with, with crowdfunding sites that, you know, analyze a hundred deals for every one that they put on their platform. Um, crowdfunding is a very illiquid form of real estate investing. Once you invest in, in a crowdfunding deal, the, the deal sponsor will usually give you a time frame. Usually it's anywhere between three and 10 years. Your money is committed for the entirety of the deal. There is usually no secondary market for these type of investments meaning that if a year down the road you want to cash out and liquidate that investment, it's not really possible to do it. So that's the biggest drawback to crowdfunding. If you invest in a, right now I'm invested in a hotel deal with a five-year target hold period, I have to assume that that money is locked up for the next five years, no matter what. So that's a, a big drawback. Great return potential, really unique investment opportunities, very illiquid. Um, most crowdfunded deals and other drawback are only available to accredited investors at the moment. You can find some that are open to the general investing public, but the best ones are pretty much restricted to what are called accredited investors. To be an accredited investor, you generally need at least $1 million in assets um, outside of your primary residence or an annual income of $200,000 or more. Um, so obviously that restricts a lot of the investing public. Um, so that's a big downside on crowdfunding. The laws are pretty fluid on these, meaning that they're evolving quickly. So it's possible that a significant portion of crowdfunding will be open to um, non-accredited investors in the near future. But for now, most crowdfunding sites restrict their deals to accredited investors. And last but certainly not least, we are right on time is real estate wholesaling, which is a really interesting concept that a lot of people aren't familiar with. Uh, wholesaling refers to essentially acting as a middleman between home sellers and real estate investors. So what a wholesaler would do uh, is do the legwork to find a really attractive real estate investment. Um, if you've pulled up at an intersection and seen the signs that say, we buy houses and have a phone number or something like that, or we buy ugly houses or, or things like that, those are, those are wholesalers. So a wholesaler will find an attractive real estate investment. A lot of times there are estate sales, properties people don't want anymore, properties that are in disrepair and people just want a quick sale. So they'll enter into a purchase agreement to buy the house, but then they will sell the rights to buy that home to an investor. So essentially they're finding the deal for them and letting the investor actually complete the purchase. So for example, if a wholesaler found a, 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 a property that, in fixed up condition would go for about $200,000. But in its current condition, they agree to buy it for $120,000. They might sell, they might charge $5,000 to an investor to be able to buy that property. So the investor's still getting a deal. They didn't have to do any legwork and the wholesaler gets $5,000 to just put it in their pocket and walk away. So that's the basic idea of wholesaling. It can be a great way to invest in real estate with little or no money. All you have to do in the property and sell it to someone else. Sounds easy, right? It's not. Um, obviously, if it was that easy, everybody would be a real estate wholesaler. It could be really hard to find attractive enough deals to make wholesaling worth it. It could be done, but wholesaling is better for people who want real estate to be their job. Um, it could be a full-time job to find wholesaling deals. There's a ton of money to be made. You really need to learn how to do it right. Just like with uh, fixing and flipping, I'd say try to start small. Um, maybe just you know set a goal of trying to find one deal to wholesale 
in the next year if you want to really learn and i mean do your research learn all you can um i'd suggest learning as much as possible before attempting that um one question that i got before this webinar was is it a good idea to use uh home equity loans to finance real estate investments it can be if you're doing it right um, right now mortgage rates are very cheap and it can be really cheap to borrow against your primary residence as long as you could afford to pay the increased mortgage payment or the, the loan payment, if the investment property didn't work out, I would say it can be an, a good strategy to tap into your home equity to buy real estate. Um, my wife and I are in the process of looking for a second home to rent out when we're not there. Um, and one way we're planning on financing some of it is to do a cash out refinance on our own home. Um, which uh, we have a substantial amount of equity in just because money is so cheap right now. So with that, it is a little after 1230. I am going to turn it back over to Kevin. Uh, thanks. And, and thanks for some great content as always. Um, I love to listen in on these because I always learn a few things, um, even down to getting a little, a little Vanguard symbol out of you. So it's always good uh, to listen in on this. Um, we hope everybody enjoyed the content. Um, so obviously, you know, what, what Million Acres is all about <clears throat> uh, is we're a service predominantly. So there's a service that we offered, multiple services, but the primary one that people use is called Real Estate Winners. And the, the cost of this is ridiculously cheap. Um, it's $249 per year. And basically it's a service that's gonna essentially deliver you uh, actual recommendations um, for you to invest in. And, um, you know, you're looking at returns in the 13, the 14, the 16% uh, range. Um, <clears throat> you know, you're going to benefit from, you know, real estate's typically what, what we'll call an unfair advantage um, and, and their tax breaks. And uh, you're, you'll be able to get in on things that you're just not going to be able to get in on by going out and, and, you know, doing some your own personal research. You know, this is folks who are experts in real estate, experts in real estate investing, uh, going out and finding the right type of, of properties, deals, REITs, et cetera, for you to put your money into where you can enjoy those kind of results. And, uh, you know, our customers are, are, are extremely happy with the service and the customer base is growing pretty substantially on, on a month in about. If you could just go back one slide real quick, Matt, that's just one thing I want to point out. Um, <clears throat> be sure to, you'll see there's a, there's a, um, there's a, there's a, a URL down there, the dot com front slash million acres lunch and learn. Um, if you're gonna go ahead and go through and and, and look at our sign up. Uh, just put that you know put that uh, URL in, and I'll take you right to a page which will give you a lot more detail about the actual deliverables of the service, and uh, and so that that'll, that'll definitely help out. Um, okay, you can go to the last slide. So one thing I want to do want to mention before we, we cut off, uh, save the date. So on February 12th at 12 p.m. same same time for our little lunch and learns here. Uh, there's a new year new investment trends uh, webinar this is great this is going to go into what we're focusing on and picking for 21 for 2021 so uh, stay tuned <clears throat> obviously if you're here for this you're going to be invited to that one um, and again this one's going to go into you know what are the trends that we're looking at what are the trends that we expect what's happening in retail what's happening in rental properties etc for the coming year so uh, again be on the lookout for that and uh, and with that we're going to go ahead and wrap the session up i want to thank matt obviously for always great content and thank all of you for you know giving us you know 30 minutes of your life we we hope that you uh are taking something good away from that uh, we hope to see you as members of of real estate winners it's a great service for the for them for the money uh and, and enjoy the benefits and the wealth that comes along with that the session is now complete have a wonderful afternoon